Hello and welcome! If you're here for the first time, my name is Miro and I love to talk about Hoyas. It's the most accurate thing I have ever said on this channel. Ooh, that's a good tea. Ginger and orange. No almond milk. Today I wanted to talk about Hoyas that I think you really should not underwater. And I know, it is repulsive, it is disgusting, because when you get into Hoyas, they promise you this succulent type plant that you don't really need to water. You can let it go dry as much as you want. You know, the taco leaf test, whatever. I, I don't know, like we should eat tacos. Have I ever eaten a taco? I don't think so. I forgot what I wanted to say. Oh yes, it is disgusting. <laughs> it just feels like a betrayal because, you know, you get into the Hoyas and you don't expect that you will need to water them too much. And as it turns out, a lot of them would like a lot of water. And if you have watched the channel for quite some time or just in the past two weeks, you probably have the impression that me and water were kind of like, well, oil and water, we don't really mix. Um, watering on time is, is just not... I want to. I want to. And then something happens, usually me deciding not to water. Anyways, we're not going to discuss my watering habits or lack of them today. I'm going to tell you from my experience what are the Hoyas that would really regularly prefer to be watered. We have a couple of groups here and I think it's going to be easy and I think some of them are really not a surprise, but we'll, we will get to that. This is just compared to something like, you know, Carnosa, Obovata, Hoya Voyeti, you know, those common Hoyas that you can really, you know, not water for 10, 15 days and they're going to be fine. I mean, have I pushed a month with some of them? Yes, I have. I do not know when was the last time I watered my variegated obovata and she looks fine. I probably should water it right after this video, but knowing me, I'm not gonna. I also want you to know that all of this is based on my experience and no one else's. I have not read this on the internet, it's just basically what I have seen with my Hoyas in my conditions. So in my room that would be around 24 to 30 or over 30 degrees of Celsius depending on the season and about 60 to 70% humidity again depending on the season. And in my grow tents where it's again Pretty similar when it comes to temperature, but the humidity is constantly over 80. In my cabinets, also, it's slightly warmer. The humidity, I would say it's about 60-ish because they are not really properly set up yet. Even though I have had them for quite a while, I just didn't get around to doing that. But that's, a, that's another video. So anything I say here is really based on my experience and just, you know, you can take it or leave it or you can also write down in the comment below what your experience has been with some of these Hoyas. So without further ado, let's just talk about Hoyas that would prefer more water. I think that the first group is really something that should not surprise any of you who have grown any sort of plant for any amount of time and that is the thin-leaved Hoyas. Thin-leaved Hoyas in general would like more water. For some of them, it's going to be fine if you underwater them. Yes, they're going to lose that firmness in the leaves, and some of them really do not have any firmness to begin with, but that's another issue. But some of them, in my opinion, are a bit more sensitive, and I really do not feel comfortable, you know, underwatering them. And in general, you would want to water these Hoyas every five to seven days, sometimes even twice a week. I know that I had to water my plants in the back. You have their Hoya multiflora. There is Hoya Loki in the back. Those Hoyas in the summer when it was 30 degrees and over needed to be watered twice a week. And that's a lot a week, if, if you ask me. Now there are some Hoyas in this thin-leaved group that I do think are less resilient to underwatering. So something like Hoya multiflora and Hoya Loki it's going to be fine if you underwater them. Worst case scenario, they're going to blast some buds and I don't think that the plant is really gonna die back. I don't think I have ever even experienced baby leaves dropping on my Hoya Lockean Multiflora. There is no vine dieback, but you know, sometimes they will blast the buds and they constantly want to bloom. So that's really not a big issue. 
if you skip a watering, you're gonna have next chance for them to bloom. Just, you know, of course, you will have to give them more water next time. But there are some Hoyas in this thin-leaved group that are a bit more sensitive and I really wouldn't push it with them. First of all, they are quite uncommon and hard to find therefore a bit pricey and I just don't feel comfortable experimenting with those and those are like Hoya Exilis, Hoya Apora, Hoya Evelinae, Hoya Thuathian Huensis, Hoya Medinillifolia. Medinillifolia is especially thin-leaved Hoya and I just would not underwater those. I really try to make sure to keep on top of the watering and we will talk about some tricks that you can use if you have some of these Hoyas, if you are like me and you are terrified of underwatering them. Now, here are some of my thin-leafed Hoyas and you can pause the video if you would like to write down this list. I know that I put Hoya Lobby on there. I don't know, I sometimes have a difficult time distinguishing like what is really a thin-leaved Hoya, which again is not the topic of this video, but I do consider Hoya Lobby to be mostly thin-leaved Hoya and that is probably because my Hoya Lobby is very underwatered. I just, you know, I gotta fix the mix. I put it in a two of a well-draining mix. So, you know, we gotta fix that and haven't gotten around to doing it. So my Hoya Lobby is definitely thin-leaved. So that is the list on the side. If you would like to write down, those are the Hoyas that I have and all of these would really like to be regularly watered. Some of them do need a bit more attention. For example, Hoya Praetori. I would say that is also very, very thin-leaped Hoya and it doesn't really get firm like Hoya. If you have Hoya Loki or Hoya Multiflora, they kind of can get firm. They're still thin, but firmer. In my experience, Hoya Praetori doesn't really do that. So that one I would say is particularly sensitive. And because they are all thin-leaved Hoyas that do want more water, you have this lovely thing that if you don't water them on time, you risk them getting mites more easily. So do water them. Now the next group is somewhat expected, I would say, and these are Hoyas with small leaves. I find that Hoyas with small leaves, with several exceptions, like maybe Hoya numularioides, do prefer more water. I would put something like Hoya lacunosa in this group, Hoya sigillatis, but I do have to say that depending on the clone, they may not want more water, or that's at least what I have experienced. For example, the regular Hoya sigillatis, I do find that this one wants a bit more water and doesn't really want to be underwatered because then the leaves will start to fall off and they are still normal. They don't even yellow, they just fall off. So it's a it's not a pretty situation. Something like Sigillatis from Alice River, I do find that that one also wants more water. I have underwatered it and it did not appreciate that at all. I had, you know, I was left with one leaf on this plant. Now it's a beautiful plant and it magnificently recovered, but I do not recommend. However, something that I think is kind of similar to Hoya sigillatis, for example, Hoya species VL9 or Hoya species GPS 7240, those I think you can get away with watering less. I, you know, I underwater them. I'm not gonna pretend that I don't. And they're fine. They're really fine. They don't really even lose the firmness on the leaves. Um, so I would say that those are not as regular sigillatis, you know, they're not so demanding of water. Anything that looks like Hoya Bella will want more water. And, you know, Hoya Bella, Hoya species Affinity Bella, PES03, which is the all white flower Hoya Bella, variegated, non variegated, outer variegated, Hoya Chinghungensis, especially Hoya Chinghungensis. Oh my god, it is dramatic. If you underwater that plant, it is drama. The leaves keep falling off and it's really ugly to look at. So make sure, like Hoya Chingungensis, I have tried to overwater it. I swear, I have tried to overwater it, which basically means I watered it regularly. And it just, it's thriving since I've been watering it every five days, six days. It has been doing really well. Hoya Vatsinioides, Hoya Engleriana, or I think I may have Species Affinity Engleriana. I really should ID that. Those are some of the Hoyas that would like more water. So anything really that looks like Hoya Bella, I would put in this category. In my last video, I mentioned that Hoya Tengchongensis and Hoya Serpents, and I do think Affinity Serpents, even though I don't have it, 
I think I can probably guess that that one will also want more water. Hoya serpents can get extremely dramatic, extremely dramatic and nasty, and doesn't really forgive that easily if you let it dry out too much. I keep mine moist at all times, and as you know, as soon as I start to do that, it thrives, especially in summer, and it, it's really not a fan of summer, just like me, completely understand, but especially in summer, do not underwater Hoya Serpents. She is not going to appreciate it, and she may hate you for a long time if you do that. I also put Hoya Baliniana on this list, but I do not have the same experience with all Hoya Baliniana. Hoya Species Affinity Baliniana UT152, I hope that the accession number is correct. That one is a bit more chill when it comes to underwatering, but inner variegated Valiniana, and maybe it's because it there's, you know, basically zero chlorophyll in that plant. That one also can get a bit dramatic when you underwater it, the leaves will start to fall off, so I would just make sure to keep that one watered. And by the way, when I say watered, I don't mean drown them. It's not a calathea, okay? I do not mean calathea in this video. We're not gonna talk about them. They are damned plants that shouldn't exist. Sorry if you love calatheas. I just cannot with the drama, but anyways, not the point of this video. I just mean when I say that you should not underwater them, it means, you know, if you are growing in uh, an organic substrate, make sure that, you know, a couple of the centimeters in the top are dry and then you can most likely water again or whatever test you like to do. If you like to use the soil meter, the moisture meter, if you like to, you know, weigh the pot. I really don't do any of these. What I do is called a memory test and that is basically when you approach a Hoya and you wonder, should I water it or not? And then you're like, when was the last time I watered it? And, you know, you go back to yesterday, the day before, the day before, the day before, and you realize it's been probably two weeks. So it's a very effective test, very effective test. Once again, I'm going to put a list of small-leaved Hoyas on the side. These are some of my small-leaved Hoyas that I have noticed that would really prefer a bit more water or more regular watering. So you can pause the video and write that down, or maybe you disagree with some of these and you can write it in the comments below. Are you done writing down the names? Can we move on to the next one? Now, I think that the next group is also kind of expected, and I would put Hoyas like Hoya Elliptica here, because that Hoya also would like not to be underwatered, if at all possible. Also Hoya Patricia, I find to be in this group. It is a bit better than Hoya Elliptica, but not really that much, so it doesn't really want to be underwatered. Maybe there are a couple of surprising Hoyas here, like Hoya Caudata, because that one does have stiff leaves, but for whatever reason, and that Hoya would also like to be watered frequently and I find that Hoya Caudata, the true Hoya Caudata, also appreciates a bit more humidity. Now if you have something like Caudata Sumatra that is most likely species affinity Caudata, those are a bit more tolerant when it comes to watering and generally humidity, so I have species affinity Caudata TN 99008, I believe is the session number. So that one is a bit more forgiving when it comes to watering, but still, you shouldn't really underwater it. Also, I think that species affinity codatas do bloom earlier, so just a bit info there if you're thinking which one you should get. But in general, those are the hoas that you really should not underwater. Something like Hoya Pandurata, Burmanica, and Polinera, because they're kind of similar-ish. They also don't really like to be underwatered. I think that Pandurata is perhaps most resilient, from my experience, when it comes to this. Hoya Burmanica, uh, if you underwater it, nothing bad will happen. It will look very scary for a bit, but I have found that nothing bad happens. You give it water and it perks up really quickly. Hoya Polinera can lose a couple of leaves, so that one can be a bit, you know, a diva, but I have found Hoya Burmanica and Pandurata to be a bit better when it comes to underwatering. Similarly to Hoya Caudata, Hoya Flagellata is also something that doesn't really want to be underwatered. I have not found that anything dramatic happens in this case. Maybe the vine will die back, but that is mostly it. However, if you do give it water regularly, I promise you it is going to grow quite fast and it's going to bloom very early on and it's going to constantly bloom for you. So that is another thing. If we water them on time, they're going to do just 
so, so, so much better. Trust me, from my own experience, because I have not watered my Hoyas in the first year and a half, and they were not growing, and as soon as I started to water them more regularly, they just, you know, turned to a completely different plant. I do find that there are a couple of Hoyas that are really, really terrible, like Hoya Chloranta and Hoya Vitiensis. I have underwatered my Hoya Vitiensis, and I had to start it over. It had dropped all of the leaves. So definitely do not recommend you underwater Hoya vitiensis, but Hoya chloranta is in general, I think, a spider mite magnet. So if you underwater it, it's just not gonna help that. I just really don't think that maybe, I don't know how I feel about us growing Hoya chloranta. But anyways, I don't know how many of you are growing it, but here is the list on the side. So if you want to write it down, these are the Hoyas uh, that are perhaps somewhat unexpected, but are definitely the Hoyas that also need to be watered regularly. And now we come to the shocking category. It is a travesty. It is a scandal that these Hoyas would like to have more water, but believe me, they do. And the first one on this list is gonna probably surprise a lot of people, but it is Hoya undulata. Hoya undulata, you would never think. First of all, they say Hoya undulata is Hoya that easily rots, which I have not had issue with mine, but I have sent Hoya undulata, and I know that it did get dry in the shipping and it died. I can maybe talk about that experience a bit here, but uh, Hoya undulata, first of all, it is not as firm as you would think. When you see the photos, you think it's going to be more like Hoya caudata. It is not. It is much more pliable than Hoya caudata. And really, if you underwater Hoya undulata, it, first of all, you know, it, it's very dear to me. I don't think it's my favorite Hoya anymore, but it's very dear to me. And it is very scary when you touch the leaves and you can see and, and feel that the plant has been under water. Now, something like Hoya undulata can be a bit tricky, and we are going to come back to this in the later segment of this video. But other Hoyas from this list are Hoya mitrata, very similar to undulata. The leaves are even more pliable, and that one, first of all, I, I don't find that it develops a massive root system anyways, so if you underwater it, it's just gonna lose the firmness in the leaves. What I didn't expect is Hoya lambi. Hoya lambi is just a pain. It's a pain. Hoya lambi wants a lot of water, I still have not figured out how much. I am trying to water it once a week, but it seems to just not be enough. This Hoya really wants a lot of water, and I cannot say that mine is thriving, but just so you know, this is not the easiest Hoya. I would say it's probably one of the most annoying Hoyas that I currently have. And we are just going to end it with that, with Hoya Lambi, but I definitely think this Hoya wants more water. Another surprising thing for me was Hoya Meredithi. You would think that Hoya Meredithi is something like Hoya Callistophila, but it is really not. Hoya Meredithi definitely does not like to dry out. The leaves are also very pliable as they are. They are not that thick. You might think it's thick, but it's not really that thick, and the leaves are very, very big. So this Hoya for me definitely has done so much better since I started to water it more regularly. Could you be louder? I also find that Hoya Rinse is something that wants more water. I have had some issues with mine because I didn't water it in time, and I strongly recommend that you do not really let Hoya Rinsey dry out. Some of these Hoyas are, I would say, a bit more sensitive and it can really get tricky when you really underwater them once. It can just become this vicious circle of you trying to figure out the watering and I, I find that with Hoya Rinsey, you don't get to really try a lot. So I, I recommend that you just water it every five or six days, obviously depending on your conditions, but don't really let it dry out because if you stress some of these, they're not gonna be so quick to bounce back. A lot of them will, but some of them are just not that forgiving. Also a bit unexpected for me is Hoya Nicholsonia New Guinea Ghost. I find that Hoya Nicholsonia New Guinea Ghost is one of the Hoya Nicholsonias that would like the most water. I have, I think, four clones of Hoya Nicholsonia or possibly five. And I find that these Hoya Nicholsonia with smaller leaves, just like my Hoya PNG6, which has also been uh, found out to be Nicholsonia, 
it just, it's not so dramatic as New Guinea Ghost because New Guinea Ghost, first of all, the leaves again are more pliable than any other Nicol Sonia that I have had. Even this one with smaller leaves, PNG6, the leaves are small, but they do have more firmness to them compared to New Guinea Ghost. New Guinea Ghost will yellow and the leaves will fall off if you underwater it. And for example, that other one that I keep mentioning, PNG6, that one is just not gonna grow. If you don't water it, it's just not gonna grow. For me, first year, nothing. I didn't water it enough and I got nothing from that plant. Now, I make sure that it's regularly watered and it's growing the fastest it has ever grown. It is a beautiful plant, in my opinion, and I truly love it. Sometimes it does take trial and error, and sometimes, you know, you get to try and error, but the reason why I'm making this video is because in a lot of the cases, you don't. So I'm going to put a list to the side of Hoyas that are, I think, unexpected, or were at least unexpected for me. I don't know, maybe you expect this, but I'm just talking about <laughs> me not really expecting that these want more water. So you can pause and write it down. I find that Hoya Archboldiana and Onycoides also want to be watered regularly. And that was just a big betrayal, if you ask me, because the leaves are just big and thick, and you would really think that this Hoya can withstand a lot of underwatering, but it simply cannot. It's just gonna become very annoying. It's gonna continue growing. The worst thing is it's not even gonna die back. No, it's gonna continue growing and it's gonna keep losing the baby leaves, which is incredibly frustrating when you have a vine that is one meter long and you know, you have four leaves on it max. So I just generally have very, very complicated feelings towards Hoya Archboldiana and Hoya Onycoides. Now, when it comes to reaction of these plants to underwatering, they can really be very, very different. I think the best case scenario, you lose the tip of the vine, you lose a couple of leaves, and I, I really don't think that's terrible because you can always trim them back. Or, you know, in case of Hoya Lucky or Hoya Multiflora, you are most likely going to lose the buds. They're gonna fall off. And this is actually uh, true in general for most of the Hoyas. They tend to want more water when they are about to bloom. And if you underwater them, they are going to blast the buds and then you can wait for the next blooming cycle, which for something like Hoya Lockean Multiflora comes really fast. For some of the others, not so much, but again, it's not the end of the world if you underwater them. However, some can get really dramatic, and I found the most dramatic ones to be Rinci from Borneo or Hoya undulata. Now, I mentioned to you, I sent two Hoya undulatas. They were both in pawn. One had two, one had six leaves. So those were both rooted cuttings. They were both watered when they were sent out and they were both going to the same place. The one with six leaves had a much better developed root system. The one with two leaves didn't. They were also both in the same sized pot. Unfortunately, upon arrival, the bigger one that had more leaves died. It dried out too fast. It was in pawn, it was wrapped in the saran wrap, but it just, it was not enough for this plant. It had more leaves, it had a more developed root system, so it sucked up the water more quickly, and the roots just dried out. And unfortunately, sometimes when they become this flimsy, you don't really know, has the root rot started already? So it can also be dry rot. So the roots can die back while being dry. And you know, you try to water it, but the condition doesn't approve. Maybe you think it needs more water and then you really have a root rot that, you know, <laughs> has progressed. I have always been kind of more careful with mine. I'm not saying that there weren't times when I have experienced the leaves becoming very soft, very pliable, which means that it was really underwatered, but it has bounced back from that. But in this case, because this was probably a smaller plant, it didn't really bounce back. But I had it in different mixes, in bark with moss, in regular potting mix, regular for Hoyas, which is cocoa peat, perlite, and bark. I had it in semi-hydro and now in pond. And across the board, I find that it just dries out very quickly. It just sucks up all that water and you have to make sure that you water it. And I think that's probably the worst case scenario when you underwater your Hoyas. Sometimes you can just let it go for too much and then the dry rod sets in and then when you water it, you are working with much less of the root system and then by that time you have 
actually overwatered it because the root system is smaller or the alive part of the root system is smaller. So I think actually when people say that it's better to underwater than to overwater, I think it's better to have a proper mix <laughs> and to water on time uh, if you can. Again, not saying anything here, I'm a notorious underwaterer. Also another side effect of you not watering your Hoya on time is that they are just not going to grow as fast. If you don't water them, they're not going to grow. They are going to be very, very slow. And a lot of people think that Hoyas are very slow. I don't in general. I think that a lot of them are very, very fast growers, depending on the Hoya. There are obviously still slow ones, but in the majority of the cases, uh, when I started to water them more regularly, I have just seen a tremendous amount of growth. Also, there could be other reasons why your Hoya isn't growing, like mites. I know that everyone is talking about mites now, Enjoy. I'm not going to talk about that. That was a traumatic experience for me in 2020, and I mentioned it in one of the videos, and I'm not gonna go into that again, and especially I'm not getting a microscope to see them from up close. I know that the bastards are there, and they have to spray them. I'm actually probably gonna get a microscope at one point, but that's beside the story here. So, what are some of the solutions to this problem? Well, the most obvious one is water your plants on time. I know, that's that's... Shocking, shocking, revolutionary suggestion. I don't really have so much time. There are around 300 Hoyas, plus philodendrons, plus anthuriums, and again we have some violets, and it gets a bit challenging. Also, for many different reasons, you may not be able to water your plants on time. One of those is that we live in this period from 2020 to now, which is a lovely period, and Sometimes you don't feel like watering plants, we get depressed, or you have a lot of work to do, and you just cannot water them. Or it is an incredibly hot summer, and the temperatures are 44 or 45 degrees. And when it's 45 degrees, I don't want to be alive, let alone water my plants. Many, many reasons why we cannot water them. So there are some solutions. There are some things that you can do when potting your cutting, or repotting, or whatever, that can ensure that, you know, it doesn't become too challenging because believe me, believe me when I tell you that I have lied to myself so many times and I told to myself, oh, I will just put more bark. It's even better because I can water a bit every day or every other day. And do you know how that turned out? It didn't. So I do not suggest that you lie to yourself. Just be very honest with you about how much time you will have. So the first thing, the choice of the pot. I really love to use plastic pots for my Hoyas. I know it's not preference for everyone. I know that some people love terracotta pots. I have grown them in terracotta pots and no. I mean, I have also tried to grow Calatheas in terracotta pots. It was awful. Plastic pots are going to hold on to moisture longer. And I don't personally think this is a bad thing. Thing. First of all, you know, plastic pots are the easiest to find, easy to reuse if you don't expose them to the sun, like if you have a nice cover pot and don't expose the inner pot. They're fairly cheap, very easy to clean and sterilize, and I use for all of my Hoyas, I use a plastic pot. I have been on the terracotta whatever you want to call it, and I do have about 300 terracotta pots that are cleaned. <laughs> Please pick them up. Someone come and pick them up. I don't need them. I don't know what to do with them. The beneficial thing, and a lot of people, you know, who are overwaterers say that they use them because they overwater, so they wick away the moisture, and the moisture will pretty quickly be in the walls of terracotta. There are several reasons why I don't use them. First of all, I find that when you have, you know, a healthy number of plants, three plus hundred, I find that when you water them all at once, because that is what I do for the most part, then the humidity in the room will just explode. You will have all this moist terracotta and it is awful. And you will also get mold on the pots, not algae. You will get that too, but like mold and 
it's just not something that I want to have in my in my space because this is also my bedroom. So, you know, plant slash bedroom. Not for me. Also, because I am not someone who overwaters, terracotta pots are really not useful for me. If you want to use them, again, you just have to understand you are really going to have to water more, again, depending on the mix, but I, I would really not go once a week in a terracotta pot. I would water them much sooner than that. I also used to use the orchid pots um, or to make orchid pots. You can buy orchid pots that have slits in the sides and this is for circulation, for the ventilation of the roots, which is amazing and wonderful. I used to use hydroponic pots, so um, those black pots with slits on the sides, and they were fantastic. However, I had to water a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. So not something that I love. However, if you're growing in semi-hydro, those pots are great. In organic mixes, I would perhaps use a different pot because in semi-hydro, you always have water in the reservoir. So it's not that challenging, right, to, to keep up with all these holes on the side that ventilate your pot. I mean, I, I also think it's possible to grow in organic mix. I used to do it. I used to grow in bark and moss in those types of pots. It was fine, but it was more work than I have now and I'm striving for less work because the collection is increasing and you know with that the time that you have to dedicate to the plants is decreasing so you know you you gotta give up on some of the concepts that perhaps you used to love but those were great and though they are really good for the roots but just make sure to know that if you use something like that you are really going to have to step up your watering game. When it comes to pots, I find the best solution for me personally is a self-watering pot. A lot of these soils that want more water, I do try to put them in a self-watering pot or if they want to be more regularly watered. And I find that that works the best. They are going to grow much faster. And, you know, if they have to rely on me to water them, it's not going to be that great. So if you have access to self-watering pots, I would say that most likely all of them can grow in self-watering pots. I mean, I even tried Hoya Jennifer. It still actually is in self-watering pot. It has never grown more. I have a lot of them in small self-watering pots that I got from a friend and they are just thriving. So you know, I think even if you are overwater or underwater, self-watering pot is just a good choice. It's a it's an expensive choice. Let me make that clear. That's the reason why I don't have more of them because they are not really cheap. There are ways for you to hack your self-watering pot, which I have tried on multiple occasions, and I just have never been 100% happy. I even tried to make my own indicators for whatever reason we cannot get them here. I don't know why. I know that you can get them. I think on Amazon people get those indicators. We cannot get them here. I don't know why. Let's not talk about it. But I still have not found the best combination of inner and outer pot to make a decent self-watering pot for myself. A lot of the prices that I see on self-watering pot are just ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. And so far, I think most of the self-watering pots that I had had some sort of a flaw. Not all of them, but most of them had some sort of a flaw. The company out there should reach out to me and I should tell them how to make a self-watering pot. Each one will probably be attached to a one liter bottle <laughs> so it can refill. <laughs> and I don't have to water for at least a month or a month and a half. That would be a fantastic solution. Pot size is also very important. Obviously, smaller pots are going to hold on to less moisture. Bigger pots are going to hold on to more moisture. This is very simple concept. However, I do not understand why it's sometimes not clear to me. I have, you know, two and a half meter Hoya in a 10 centimeter pot and I get frustrated because it needs water all the time. Duh. Repot it, Miro, repot it. The roots have started to get out of the pot a long time ago. I know a lot of people say, go for the smallest possible pot for Hoya. It is not something that I do. Again, not an overwaterer, and I don't find that pot size has anything to do with blooming. My Hoyas have bloomed in semi-hydro, in pond, in regular mix, in big pots, in small pots. It has nothing to do with the pot size. It has nothing to do with the potting mix. I know that a lot of people will say that in the groups. If there is at least one Hoya that will bloom in semi-hydro, it is untrue. So 
we cannot take that as a rule. If you want to make your life a bit easier, I would choose a bigger pot. I did that for my Hoya Loki and Hoya Multiflora. I put those plants in 15 centimeter pots and it did make it slightly easier. However, they also started to grow faster and now we are basically at the time where the root system filled out that pot as well and uh, you know it's just like can you be more considerate of the space given to you but really i just think that for a lot of these going less than 12 centimeters is not particularly useful 10 centimeters for small ones very rarely i will go for less than that well not very rarely it will actually depend on the space. Quite often I will actually go for 8 centimeters, but I cannot tell you the amount of times I have gone for 8 centimeters and it was just an abysmal mistake. And I did it because I didn't have space or I didn't have a pot that's big enough. You can root in smaller pots, that's fine, but I would move it to something bigger. If you have Hoya Lacunosa, small-leaved Hoyas, they can stay in 8 centimeter pot for quite some time and then you move them to 10, whatever, that's fine, but I just, you know, I have rooted big leaf toys in 8 centimeter pots and that's just ridiculous. What I'm trying to say here, pot size is going to really matter. If you have some Hoya and you're not an overwaterer and if you don't have a lot of time, I would just tell you go with the bigger pot. Especially if it's something like Multiflora, Lucky, Lacunosa, Retusa, Linearis even. I put all of those in slightly bigger pots. I have put even my Pandurata from Betsy in a bigger pot. It arrived in a 6 or even 5 centimeter. I put it in 10 right away. Thriving. The plant is growing super fast. It's about to bloom. Nothing is wrong with it. I just did it because I didn't want to have to water all the time. You know your habits the best. Be honest with yourself and you know if you can put it into a bigger pot or not. Nothing bad is going to happen. You're not going to stunt the growth. They're going to continue to grow because again, has nothing to do with the size of the pot. Now, choice of the potting mix is very, very important. I would say for a lot of these Hoyas that want more water, Cocoa Peat and Perlite is a good choice if you want to grow in organic mix. 50-50 Cocoa Peat and Perlite is a great mix. And this mix will work really well for Hoyas like Hoya Lacunosa, Hoya Bella, Hoya Cinquungensis, Hoya Vatsinioides and Glariana. I would even put less Perlite in those. So maybe 60-40, 40% perlite, or maybe even go with 30 if you're extremely brave. Hoya, Praetori, all of those are gonna enjoy in this mix. I have all of them in that mix and there's nothing wrong with them. Hoya Caudata as well. That's kind of like my go-to mix for a lot of the more commonly grown Hoyas. Obviously, if you want to grow in inorganic mix, you can choose to go semi hydro way or you can choose Pawn. And I find that they do really well in both. Pawn is my preference. I did try semi hydro, but right now I'm currently loving Pawn a whole lot more. If you want to grow something like Koya Undulata in organic mix, now this one can be tricky because it wants more water, but it also wants good aeration around the roots. So there are some Hoyas that are like that, that want to be, you know, want to have regular access to water, but they don't really want something like Cocoa Peat and Perlite. I don't think it would thrive in that mix. I had it in Cocoa Peat and Perlite with lots of bark in there, and that was a good mix, but again, you are going to have to make sure that you water them on time. Otherwise, it can do really, really well in pawn. Now, depending where you live, if you make a mix that is very chunky for these Hoyas that want more water, you might be looking at watering even three times a week. And I'm not really joking. If you have them in a hot room or even outside in the summer and it's very hot and there isn't a lot of rain, you may be looking at watering them potentially even every day. If you are in Texas, it gets very hot in Texas. Um, if you, I mean here in Serbia, it gets very hot and very dry in summer and they can dry out really quickly. I don't grow my Hoyas outside. I have tried and I have seen how much water one needs and I said, no, we're not doing that. We're absolutely not doing that. I don't care that they're gonna thrive because they're outside. It is just way too much work for me. So just be aware of the different seasons. I think most of us grow in places where there is a distinct um, change between the seasons and if you're someone who takes your plants out, just be aware that that mix that you used for your room or for your grow tent where you have high humidity. For example, I grow my Hoyas, a lot of my Hoyas in my Mars Hydro grow tent. 
and in that grow tent i do have access to a good light so it's a very bright environment humidity is 80 percent temperature is 24 to 30. and a lot of who is in that tent are either in pawn or in cocoa peat and perlite with bark less of them are in cocoa peat and perlite with bark but even hoya burmanica and hoya pandurata that want more water were when, with some bark in there because again it is constantly high humidity however if i were to take those hoyas out from my grow tent and if i were to put them outside during the summer that is not gonna do it's still good light and the temperature but i changed one thing and i changed the humidity and that is gonna throw everything off the you know train rails whatever you want to say because pawn outside is going to dry out in less than a day so you will have to water every single day if you don't have a self watering pot and the same goes for mixes that have a lot of bark they're just gonna dry out much faster because i live in a climate where outside in the summer it can be as low as 20 percent i think even lower than that this summer and the temperature can be as high as 40 44 degrees first of all yes it is hotter than the, in the grow tent because i have never had more than 30 in my grow tents but you know also the humidity drop is significant and they're not going to do well outside you know, just be mindful of those things also some people don't keep their house warm during the winter so with the decrease of the temperature the humidity will also most likely rise if you don't use central heating and then you can really reduce your watering depending you know what the temperature in the room is this room is heated it gets to be i think 22 or 23 and that's with minimal heating because the plants also do a great job obviously when you have three grow tents three cabinets and you know possibly 50 60 plants outside of all of those and you live in this room you know it's gonna heat up just from that so the radiator the one radiator doesn't even have to be turned on all the way i actually reduce it compared to the ones in the rest of the house. If the temperature in winter is lower in your grow space, you can also reduce the watering. When it comes to light, again, my Hoyas here and in the tents, they all grow under some type of a grow light. Only the ones in the back in the Rutsta cabinets are under regular LED lights, but the rest of them are under Mars Hydro grow lights and they get light all year round because we work with two northwest facing windows which we have tried to trick ourselves to think it's west it's not we can't lie to the compass and there isn't much light coming in there is a decent amount of light but definitely not for this you know quantity of plants and this far in the room so if you work with less light you also are likely going to have to water your hoya less how frequently you have to water your hoyas will depend on light temperature humidity what potting mix you chose what pot you chose and obviously what hoya you grow all right that is all for today i hope that you enjoyed this video and i hope that you found it useful i would like to hear your thoughts and opinions on this so if you have hoyas that you want to add to this list feel free to do that in the comments below if you were surprised by some hoya i really was surprised by hoya undulata and hoya lambi how much water they need you can leave that in the comment down below i don't think my list is complete i just you know tried to think of all of my hoyas but you know there are 300 of them or so so i most likely missed some and also some of them are debatable so i just didn't really want to put them in this list but you know all from my experience it's just much better if they are all watered on time it, it was a lie that's all I can tell you. It was a big, big, big lie. They are not cacti, they are tropical plants. And when it comes to their care, they are far more similar to orchid than to a cactus. And if you don't water your orchids, you're doing it wrong. And also don't water with ice. Hoyas, orchids, cat, just ice is for other things. I love that every time I mention orchids and watering orchids, and if I, you know, make a connection with Hoyas, I have to mention, do not water with ice. Love that company, love it. If you like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up. And if you're not subscribed to the channel, make sure to do so right now because you'd most likely want to hear more about Hoyas if you made it this far. And there's gonna be a lot more Hoya talk. So like, it's, it's clear what you need to do. And with that, it is time for me to finish my video and water my Hoyas.
I'm just joking, don't get excited. Bye! I would like to take some time to thank my patrons. A massive shout out to my $5 patrons. My three anonymous patrons, Alex von Siebenthal, Anne Margaret Moen, and C. Betsy Begonia, Carrie Cynthia Taylor, Danube Daniels, Daria Kaminska, Farah, Gina Geise, Go Green Tropical, House von Heather, Hoya Heather, Jacques, Plant Journey, Jessica Chio, Kayla Vavra, Kelso, Kristen Sherwood, Lauren Alexandra, Le Plan de Steph, and I get to practice my French, Mars B, Marty Miller, Melissa Walker, Nicole Ferranti, Nicole and Caleb of Schlieve Tropicals, Nita Macy, PJ, Rachel Colette Con. Conroy, Robin L. Jennings, Ruby, Sherry Kumar, Stephanie H2O, Tanya, TJWO, Wendy, and Zlokob Nipponi. Also, a big thank you to my $3 patrons, Angelina Farnan, Anne Margaret, Brana Phillips, Kilone, Claudia L., Jerry's Garden, Lisa Helling, Morgan Kennedy, Morgana Devina, Nella, Nerdy Kathy, Plantelania, Ringlov, Sheila Mason Casper, and Tang Watanas Riakul. And a thank you to my $1 patrons, Brandon Pacheco, Carrie Hacinta, Lauren M., Lori Ann Subramaniam, Luzman Fernandez, Marissa, and Paula Plants. Thank you also much for your incredible support. I hope that you enjoyed this video and if you have some extra time, you can freely come and water my Hoyas. I will not mind at all. Have a wonderful week and I will see you soon.